So can I kick it off or you want to, or you're working? Hi, yeah, you're working. I'm Go Sierra. Real Sierra. I'm real Sierra this time. And this is an ACM webcast. Thank you for joining on the very first or second ACM webcast, I guess. It's a continuation of our series, Attack Tactics with John Strand. John Strand, and the crowd goes wild. Well, thank you very much, Sierra. And it's good to be back in studio because <laughs> I haven't been in here in a while. And I can a month. It's, it's really nice to see that only half of our tiles appear to be <laughs> The last off. time we were here was July 3rd. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the, the, we have soundproofing tiles and uh, I don't know, we put sticky stuff on them and they, they stay for like two months and then they, they start falling off. But, but we're in a fridge, yeah. right? in all honesty, we're in a fridge that, and we are actually, we actually have the contractor, they're gonna start tearing this out and eventually we will have a real studio and that'll be fantastic moving forward. All right, so this particular webcast is Attack Tactics. It's the fourth one that we've done. For those of you that are relatively new to these webcasts, the goal of the Attack Tactics series was to walk through a penetration test, a red team, an actual assessment that we did on a customer and go through all of the steps of the attacks that we did as part of that assessment in one webcast. And then in the second webcast, kind of rehash some of those quick, quickly, some of those tactics quickly, but then come back and talk about defenses. Because there's very little in the way of information that actually talks about an entire attack from beginning all the way to the end, and then goes through the various defensive components that an organization could have put in place to stop that attack. And that was really the goal of the Attack Tactics series. Now, this particular series, or this particular set, um, is brought to you by Wild West Hack and Fest, the greatest hacking conference um, in the West. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Check it out. We strive to be one of the most hands-on conferences in the world. In fact, while I was at DEF CON, I thought you would find this interesting. DEF CON has their uh, competition floor, right. and they have all of these challenges all over the place. And I am pretty sure that Wild West Hack and Fest will have just as many, if not more, challenges than even DEF CON. What? Um, or I should rephrase that. We'll have just as many, if not more, good challenges as <laughs> DEF CON. Uh, so check we, it out. We do our best. Yeah, it's not just the talks, right? It's the talks. It's the lightning talks. We're going to be doing like 10-minute talks. It's the uh, it's all of the extra hands-on with IoT Village, a car hacking village by Grim Cyber, which is fantastic. And then software-defined radio hacking, wireless hacking, embedded device security hacking, active countermeasures, and I believe doors. we're talking about, what's that? Oh, the, the doors. doors. We have the doors. We, how many doors do we have? It's like so 10. Many, eight, I think so many eight, doors, ten. but all kinds of locks to pick, different things to bypass. An escape room. Oh, an escape room, right? Yep, so this is insane. You need to come out. It's going to be it's going to be a very good time. It's also brought to you by SAN Security 504. It's just simply the greatest computer security class of all time. So check out SANS 504 and let's get started. Now, this particular attack is uh, the one that we covered a month ago almost. Uh, this attack is truish. There's a number of different attributes of the attack that I have shifted because I didn't want to give away protect too much the information. Innocent. To protect the innocent or the guilty. <laughs> um, and also the names and the screenshots are faked or I pulled them directly from our blog or on Google image search. I didn't want to use the exact screenshot from the test, whereas I can find something that's very similar to what the test had. And I try to give credit as much as I possibly can. And we have customers that attend these webcasts and they say, well, this looks like my network and it's you're talking about my company. No, probably not. <laughs> uh, the reason why is we have a lot of networks that have the exact same vulnerabilities again and again and again and again, and we're going to be addressing those vulnerabilities. So let's jump in. So this particular scenario, uh, the first scenario we did, we covered an organization that had a domain controller, right? They had a DMZ. You could attack a system in the DMZ, pivot through the DMZ, and gain access to internal resources on that network. And that's Fine, right? I mean, this is the vast majority of networks out there has an internal network. They have a DMZ and, you know, you break through the DMZ and then get in. You could do that through spear phishing, breaking into a server that's on the DMZ, all kinds of different ways. But this is not that network. No, this particular network was a network that was a purely cloud-based organization. And this is great for a couple of reasons. First reason why this is great is many organizations are now hybrid. They're going to have an active directory environment, but they're also going to have cloud-based assets as well. Further, we're seeing more and more organizations moving forward that are purely cloud-based. Everything is in the cloud, and that was this organization. This particular organization had Slack, which a lot of you use. They had Google Apps, they had GitHub, and then basic cloud infrastructure for their services. And then all of their users were spread 
all over the country. In fact, this is very similar to the way Black Hills Information Security is. We have a number of users spread all over the place. We all tie into a Google domain, and we have a number of different resources that we use at Black Hills Information Security that are purely cloud-based. We have no Active Directory. In fact, if you're ever trying to break into Black Hills Information Security, which you shouldn't do, but if you do, <laughs> and you find yourself in an Active Directory environment, congratulations, you just found one of our Active Directory labs. We don't ever use Active Directory for a day-to-day -day business. So the first step that we covered in the previous webcast was the open source recon to identify users, services, network blocks, and vulnerabilities in passwords, and that's all in the cloud. So you can use Recon NG, you can also use Multego to identify network blocks. And then based on those network blocks, you can expand the total number of IP addresses that are exposed publicly that can then be attacked. Mm -hmm. Also, Chris uh, has been doing a lot of work with Black Hills Information Security as a 1099 bounty hunter, and he has a fantastic tool uh, called Eyewitness. And Eyewitness will go through an XML file from uh, Nmap or a number of different outputs, and it'll identify all the different port 80s and port 8080 potential web servers that are running. And then I'll take a screenshot of all of those different web servers. And this is incredibly valuable for us as pen testers trying to break into organizations, because if we're trying to break into an organization that has 150 web servers or a thousand web servers, the scanning tools that are out there will just say, I found a web server potential vulnerabilities, but it won't give us context as far as what that web server actually is. So we can take screenshots and identify Tomcat servers, F5 um, firewalls, and also default pages like the Apache web page as well. Now, Shodan is another great utility. Shodan is fantastic because it will give you uh, kind of the banners for a specific network range for services. This allows us to identify Telnet services, SSH services, IP phones, things of that nature. And then we will use that to enumerate additional potential vulnerabilities that we can attack. Now, some people will ask, why don't you just run Nessus? Well, when you're doing a red team and you're trying to break in, you don't necessarily want to get caught. And of course, that depends on the scope and how you coordinate that with the customer. But sometimes you don't want to get caught. So a lot of this recon that we do is using open source APIs and open source websites to learn as much about a target organization as we can without actually touching that particular organization. Um, oh, yeah. Martin says, we black showed on, are there others? Are there others? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of them uh, that'll actually go through and crawl your website. In fact, yeah, you can basically go to a McDonald's and crawl a website and get service banners as well. But I still think that if you want to block Shodan, that's fine. Um, that, that's pr probably just fine. Most organizations never would. Also, Shodan's ha Shodan has this amazing feature to take screenshots of servers like remote desktop, VNC services, amazing for us to be able to identify all the different services that are available on the outside of a network. Now, let's talk about defenses. I wanted to get through that fairly quickly, right? If you want full in-depth of Shodan and what we do and, and trying to do recon, go one webcast back to Attack Tactics Part 3 and watch that one. So let's talk about defenses. One, I'm a huge fan of cyber deception. Um, I just got back from the class at Black Hat, which was wildly successful on cyber deception and hacking back and all of these different things. And we like to look at things like the OTA loop and how we can break an attacker's ability to successfully learn information about a network. So OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. It was basically developed by John Boyd of the Air Force. And it had a lot to do with whenever you're working with airplanes and fighter jets, whatever fighter jet operator could observe, orient, decide, and act the fastest was the one that got to continue living. So if we look at an OODA loop, right, an attacker is trying to do recon to basically improve their ability to successfully observe your network. So we can lie. Right. And with that lie or misdirect, we have a number of tools at our disposal that will make that easier for us as defenders and make it exponentially more difficult for the attackers. So, for example, we could utilize unused DNS space. So you can go to your DNS server and you can take the IP addresses and you can fill in all of your unused IP address space with fake systems. So here I did like cracked, farked, bill, James, Kim, John, mail, SMTP, FTP, DNS, VPN, Paul.com, all of these different things that are now exist on our DNS records, but it doesn't actually resolve back to anything that's alive. And an attacker will spend a tremendous amount of time spinning their wheels, trying to identify where these live systems are, what ports and services are on these systems. And in fact, they're just chasing decoys. One of my students brought up something interesting, and I wanted to bring this up uh, to Chris. 
uh, I don't know if this is legal, but this is kind of spooky. He said, put some DNS records that point to DOD IP addresses. So if somebody's coming after like your company, uh, just put in a DNS record for something that they'll mo most likely be able to brute force. Like, let's just say, you know, www.hackedcompany.com uh, that points to an IP address off in the Department of Defense. So when the attacker is trying to break in, they actually attack a network that they probably shouldn't be attacking. Well, I think that that's funny. I, I don't know. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Chris, what are your thoughts on that? So, so it's basically uh, pointing to 127.0.0.1 plus you might get swatted. <laughs> right yeah I, and there's nothing quite like seeing attackers get swatted um it's yeah, like yeah we're breaking into this hacked company your microphone's coming in really weak sir it sounds oh, like sure. it's using your headphone microphone yeah it sounds like it's using your built-in microphone on your uh, uh computer uh, but, got it. let me fix that so yeah the idea of swatting hackers i don't know that that seems bad satisfying right it's like the guy or the lady that like cuts you off in traffic and flips you off and then all of a sudden they get into a minor fender bender up above uh, up further you're like ha ha so martin says are you not slightly responsible if you do something like that meaning if you direct them to the dod i don't know if you could get sued for doing something like that i i don't like let's talk about responsibility yeah you can always be sued I would feel a little bit bad, especially if the attacker got swatted live on like Twitch or something like I'm hacking this company. I, I don't know. Um, that serves you right. It serves you right. <laughs> yeah. So let's see if Chris's mic is back. Is my mic back? Is oh, that that's that's so, much so much better. Awesome. So, so, so I doubt there's any legalese that's an issue here. Um, I would be very surprised if someone thought of a law to kind of go around this area. Uh, with that said, I think it would also be hard to find an audit trail to kind of identify this. In other words, they go bang in the DOD. Oh, it's kind of hard right. for them to make the argument, well, I was trying to break into, you know, <laughs> dot, 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 you know, foobar.com and ended up here and I'm not sure how. So, it's but fault. it's totally not my fault. It's uh, totally damn, not my fault. Damn yeah. millennial hackers. <laughs> James says, I'd rather avoid any potential altercation with the DOD. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, once you do it a couple of times, they're fine. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're good to work with. Exactly. Um, this is all part of that smoke screen, right? We can create that smoke screen and uh, check out the active defense harbinger distribution. Go to blackhillsinfosec.com forward slash projects, and you can download a whole VM. Uh, we're hosting it up on S3. You can download it. It has all the tools and videos built into it. Chris, this is a, this is a tool that we put on the active countermeasures blog. Uh, uh, I love this tool. I love this tool. Oh, my God. I love uh, this tool. So this, this, tool say, this tool okay. makes my wife jealous. <laughs> That's awkward. All right, so <laughs> port spoof, what port spoof does is on your system, you have a lot of um, unused TCP ports. And well, predominantly it's TCP ports is whenever you're using this tool. And what you can do is create a listener by default, port 4444, which you can modify in the source code. And you can put in an IP tables rule that any unused IP address space gets redirected to port spoof, and then port spoof just grabs a random banner uh, for a service and just serves that up. Uh, and there's a couple of magical things that happen with this tool. First, if you're running a port scan, it can take eight hours to finish a port scan on a system. Eight hours to finish out a full port scan on a system, number one. Number two, if we're talking about Shodan, if Shodan's trying to fingerprint your services, every time Shodan goes through, it's going to get completely different services every single time. Now, this is fun. This is great. It's going to slow down the attacker. It's going to reduce the, uh, the, the amount of time it takes for you to detect only if you have alerting. So if you're creating uh, fake servers, if you're creating fake DNS entries, if you're creating fake services, those things are great. Do that. But if you don't have alerting around it, then it really doesn't improve your ability to observe. And the attacker is honestly going to just spend more time, but eventually they will get some traction. Um, so we love this tool. Uh, so please, please, please check it out. It can absolutely mess with us whenever we're doing scans. It'll mess with any of the third party services that we use, uh, like Shodan, to, to find it. So we have a question that just popped up. Um, Brian just said, I was trying to remember the name or what this tool was called. So I'm going to use this in my student's lab. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, very, very cool. Uh, Chris, anything else on Ports Booth before we move on? Uh, just that I'd love to see an Atari 2600 banner. Because you know that what? really confuses people when they see that and they think it's a web server. There's another, um, well, you can do that in Apache headers pretty easy. Yep, that's true. Uh, that's you true. remember the old Netcraft thing 
there was an article years ago, I think you showed it to me all the way back in 2003, where somebody went to a, a Netcraft and was looking at all the different Apache banners. And they came across an Apache banner that said that it was running on a Commodore 64. And someone <laughs> wrote this long article about how this shows that if we just gave Commodore 64 a chance, it could have been an operating system contender. And it was hilarious. Yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, um, um, Martin yeah. has a question. How about port knocking? Is that a good idea? Um, port knocking is a really, really old idea that was used originally for maintaining access to servers, not as an attacker yeah. per se, but as a systems administrator. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the BSD, specifically the NetBSD developers, that first came up with the idea of port knocking, where you had to hit ports in a certain sequence to unlock the port to be able to manage that server. But yeah, it might be getting I, the BSD group wrong. It, and then I think it took about four hours and Stearns ported over onto Linux. But yeah, that was exactly it, was you had to hit a certain series of ports. And it didn't have to be TCP ports. It could be ICMP type codes. It could be UDP. But you had to send packets in a certain order. And as soon as you did, that would generate a firewall rule permitting your source IP to have some additional level of access. And, and I think that that's great. But I think today, most of us that do systems administration, that's a level of security that we just don't see very often anymore at all. Um, we just don't. And I wish more systems administrators were that paranoid. But I think that we've kind of replaced um, NOCD, I think, was the demon that did port knocking back in the day. It, yeah. We now have deny hosts or fail to ban, where if somebody's trying to attack your login, you can basically blacklist that IP address for a specified period of time instead. Uh, yeah, so we also, if you think things. about it, in a lot of ways, that's almost uh, kind of like not not two factor, but maybe you know, I don't know two two credentials to try and go after, and we've got other ways to go through and implement that now. Yeah, and if you want to do it, I, I don't think Chris or I would ever say that's a bad idea. Nothing but mad respect for someone that sets up port knocking on their uh, systems. I had one student, Chris. He set up this box. It was amazing, and he put in a cell phone modem. And if he sent a text message to this box, it would actually make a firewall rule that would allow him to access his server. And then when he was done, he could send what? another text message to shut it down. That's so, awesome. Oh, that's awesome. That's just, that's cool, right? That's cool. Um, Jason said, how is Port Spoof different than Librea? Uh, Librea is fundamentally different. Uh, Librea was created by Tom Liston uh, years ago, whenever worms and bots were spreading around. And what Librea does is whenever you are on a network, and you try to talk to another IP address on that network, your system's gonna send out an address resolution protocol packet to a broadcast address to talk to that system. And if there's no response, it'll wait, I think it's like a second, and then it'll send a second ARP request. And what Librea does is when it sees that second ARP request, it then responds and says, I'm that IP address. So you can basically have all of the unused IP address space come to a local system. So it works out really, I'm watching Chris over here. So it works out really, really well uh, for uh, for trying to slow down automated malware that's on a network. It's extremely old. It still works really, really well post-exploitation for people to crawl, uh, to stop crawlers on your website for enumerating IP address space. So port spoof, throwing up fake services on a local system, and Librea is throwing up fake systems on a network. So yeah, the other thing question. Librea would do is when the uh, person, you could map unused TCP ports to that box. And now when someone came, uh, tried to connect to it, it would complete the three packet handshake and then it would send back a window size of zero, which is basically its way of saying, uh, your call is important to me. Please continue to hold the, the <laughs> next available service will be with you as soon as possible. Here and the me, system yeah. will sit there in a pause <laughs> mode. It'll try and do a keep alive on the connection and it'll again get back a window size zero. Yes, your call is still important to us. You're 173 in the queue. Please continue to hold. Um, do you remember do, George Bacchus's? Do, 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 do you remember George Bacchus's tiny honeypot? Oh, I totally remember that. I had a ball with that tool. That, and it still works. Uh, so, what tiny honeypot does, it just serves up a pound prompt and that's it. So, an attacker thinks that they have root on a system and they type all kinds of commands and it just keeps coming back with okay <laughs> okay okay and you would keep attackers in that honeypot for like days they just would uh, not i've up. watched people execute ftp commands to pull down their toolkit <laughs> uh, try and unpack the toolkit, try and install it, try commands out of it and not understand why it was working um, in fact i seem to remember it was not me uh, but someone I heard may have actually 
gone to that FTP link, pulled down the toolkit, modified their tools so that they would no longer actually work, bundle it back up, put it back up on their FTP server again. So now when they did actually try to compromise systems after that, gee, what do you know? Your tools don't work anymore. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> yeah. And Tiny Pot was how all that was grabbed. Just From awesome. what I hear on the grapevine. Yeah, possibly. May have happened. Maybe. Yeah. So uh, next one, moving on, uh, it's scraping users with Google and Burp. Um, one of the, so recently LinkedIn. Now this is this is interesting. LinkedIn really doesn't like people scraping their website, pulling down user information as part of a pen test. Uh, they just don't. <laughs> um, go figure, right? But they really like Google indexing all of the users on LinkedIn. They, they like that a lot. They think that that's fantastic. As long as Google's here. As long as Google's here, it's fine. Um, so <laughs> what you can do is you can search site colon linkedin.com forward slash in and then do a search for Black Hills Information Security or whatever target organization. And you can still harvest those users. Now, you have to do some burp shenanigans to harvest those users out. Uh, this is Carrie Roberts. Um, uh, so then the all these things. scrapes look like they just came from Google. Yeah, they're because Google, you're not actually touching they're LinkedIn. They're just Google searches. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Google may <laughs> rate limit you, but generally they don't much anymore, especially if you're coming from a public network. So if you want to stop this, this is kind of tough, right? One of the things you could do is create fake users. And this is a user that I created, Xander Thornstenson. Uh, this is my alter ego, Chris. This is where I would have ended up if I didn't stop smoking pot. I would have ended up in prison. Uh, maybe a dishwasher at Roscoe's Pit <laughs> Barbecue in Sturgis, South Dakota. Um, but you can create these users. You don't want to make a user quite like this. Maybe make the user look a little bit more realistic. Um, but watch for any type of authentication attempts to a VPN, interesting emails. Fake is definitely fake. You want to put some time and effort into it to entice the attackers to come in. And then also train your users. This is hard, but you need to train your users at your organization to generate more generic LinkedIn profiles. It's odd because it's almost at like conflict with each other. Some organizations want their users to make their LinkedIn profile look amazing and associated with their company. I think BHIS would be in that category. If somebody's on LinkedIn, they work for BHIS, look awesome, right? We want that kind of, you know, service. Yeah, kind I of tell marketing. you to put all your certs on yeah, there. Put all of your certs. Do it all. Whereas your fake interests. <laughs> some organizations, your fake interests. Some organizations, however, they lock it down to where say you you can work for like a for Fortune 10 company mm -hmm. or a Fortune 1 company. And uh, you could make it more generic so people can't necessarily harvest things as easy. But when you create these fake users, you, once again, you need to establish tripwires in your organization that if anybody tries to interact with this user, you're able to then... Um, Sorry, I'm going to type this in. Just, you could keep talking. Okay. Um, you, uh, uh, meh. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to type, I'm trying to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a game? Are we now a game on? No, they wanted to know how you did that. Okay, cool. And if you actually do a search for Black Hills Information Security okay. Scraping Users with Google and Burp, it'll take you right to the article that Carrie wrote and she'll walk through step by step and her plugins. Nice. As and well. if someone wants to grab me a link, I'll share that with everybody. Yeah, we'll do that as well. You guys are the best. Okay. All right, the next tool that we use quite a bit is Cred King. Uh, we have a couple of tools that are just now starting to get some traction in the industry. Um, and Cred King does password spraying and it does it from Amazon Lambda. And the reason why we do this is if I do a password spray directly against an organization, they're gonna find that IP address and block it. If I do a password spray and I actually stand it up from Amazon and they stand up a whole bunch of instances in Lambda, their odds of blocking it drop quite a bit. Uh, but in this particular situation, it didn't work. Cred King didn't work. Now let's talk about attacking Google two-factor authentication because this is really a cornerstone for this entire attack. Uh, attacking Google two-factor authentication. I'm also gonna talk about defenses against Office 365 as well. Uh, so for when we attack Google two-factor authentication, there's a tool that we created called uh, CredSniper. And we just did a blog post on it yesterday, as a matter of fact, and we got a lot of hits on it already. And the whole goal of this tool is to create a spear phishing campaign that bypasses two-factor in some situations, U2FA, with UB keys. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this because we have a blog post. We also did a previous webcast on it. I wanna talk about defenses with it. But if you wanna play around with uh, CredSniper, go get it right now. 
We have all the step-by-step uh, -step instructions in our blog from yesterday. So please get set up with Cred Sniper. Did you, um, did you, you did you organize that or did that just happen? It just happened. No. Yeah, I, I, I love I, it when things Nine happen. times out of 10, I have no idea what's happening. In fact, I'm a little bit foggy as far as what day it is. <laughs> um, so moving on. <laughs> So phishing ruses, right? Just gotta be evil. You can do calendar injection, HR violation, be careful with that one. But phishing ruses matter, right? I just spent a good portion of yesterday talking with uh, Egypt and Rick Wisser uh, coming up with a phishing ruse and being a highly targeted whale fish at an organization. So that requires some training. So let's talk about user awareness training. Training people is really hard. Um, and I haven't, once again, standard disclaimer, anytime we do webcasts like this, Chris you? and I, no, that's not. Why did you think that was? <laughs> okay, anyway. Does it look familiar? No, no, but you know, it looks like someone. We were talking real earlier picture. about how hard it would be to replace me. Um, so, <laughs> screaming child. It would be. Okay, you and Chris were talking, we're, we're, and blah, blah, blah. Whenever we do webcasts, Paul and I, Chris and I, we don't like to share slides, right? Because we want people to come in and kind of give opinions. It creates better tension, better conversation. So, user awareness training is interesting because people have very conflicted opinions on it. Some people say, uh, we've got to do user awareness training. And other people say, well, user awareness training never works. It's a load of crap. I, I, sure I don't know. Uh, so I Chris- a perfect example of user awareness uh, yes, training. Yes, <laughs> I want to share that story here in a bit. Uh, Chris, uh, what's your take on user awareness training? So user awareness training, I think it's a must because most uh, attestations require it and you need to meet that attestation. So to me, there's a difference between trying to meet an attestation so you have some pretty symbol to show on your website about how secure you are and actually doing something that's gonna make things secure. And I don't think the training helps so much as actually testing. So mm -hmm. one of the things I'm really, really, really big on is, uh, setting up a reward program for your employees to go through and um, report phishing when they see it. Uh, some of the best, the, the best training bar none I ever saw, um, they did a program where they said, okay, if you are the first person to tag a phishing attack, whether it be a test or whether it be real, and um, you're the first one to detect it and you report it through these, this channel here, you will be the protector of the Metcliffe for the next month. And they would have a ceremony with, yes, people dressed as Klingons with a Metcliffe that would go to this person's cubicle and scream the, the honors of their battle and how you know, valiant they were in defending the realm and present them with the Metcliffe for the next 30 days. And oh my God, everybody wanted that damn Metcliffe. That's so you get, IT. <laughs> so yeah, and so for, for those who aren't that geeky, a Metcliffe is a Klingon battle knife. Um, is, that, is that the big one? No, that's the little one. The You're thinking one. of okay. Batliff, it's the little one, yes. Yeah, yeah. the one that lets you get in close and personal. You know so, what's awesome? Uh, this is a company that was literally handing out edged weapons to its employees. <laughs> Well, there was only one and it got passed around, but you, everybody made a big deal about it in front of the person's cube. You go through a brief period of time where everybody thinks everything is fishing, or at least they hope, and never dissuade folks from that. Always show them, hey, it's not, and this is how I figured it out. Train, leverage that as part of regular education. But there's a whole, and I, and John, I should probably do another blog entry on this. There's a whole dopamine cycle thing where that actually, the whole thing about I got to check my mail, I got to check my mail, I got to check my mail, you're never going to unwire people from that. But if you can redirect the reward center from I got to check my mail to see if it's something interesting to, hey, this might be phishing, let me analyze it as phishing, uh, that actually fixes the problem. I've seen sites drop from 30% capture rates with phishing down to less than five yeah and that's and that's just great also having paranoid people i don't know chris if i ever told you the story um uh, what do you mean by Sec, that this, this next story so trusted sec does our pen tests against black hills information security by the way mm -hmm. we're always happy with trusted sec one of our sister organizations and um, i was talking with their team and they were coming up with a ruse and they said uh we want to spearfish sierra and i'm like don't don't do that and they're like no 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 she's public she's she's uh she's out there and also you know she she's not like a, a pen tester so we think we have a good chance of getting sierra yeah. to click a link and we're like i'm like no <laughs> don't just don't like no 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 we, we got this we got this i'm like okay so 
they send the fish in, and I would say, what, five minutes after you got it? Maybe. Maybe faster? Yeah, maybe faster. I mean, I don't like to brag, but. <laughs> it was like, it went out to everyone in the company. It's like, this is a spearfish, everybody. We are being attacked. <laughs> this is an attack that's coming in. And then our systems administrators, Jordan and Kent, they tracked back the domain. They're like, this is owned by Trusted Sec. It looks like they're trying to hack our network. Let's go after them, everybody. And I'm like, what? No, no, <laughs> no, no, stop, everybody. Um, but but we have that high level of paranoia, right? We're getting attacked all the time. In fact, I talked with Martin and, uh, and uh, Dave Kennedy, and they're, we're going to be starting up the cycle of pen testing again. I but, hope they uh, come after me. Yeah, I don't think they will. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's like having like a whole like herd of big big brothers, big sisters to be like, help, someone's beating up on me. And they're like, wow. Yeah, they got, they got freaked out. But, but that works because we have that certain level of awareness because we do these attacks all the time. You do social engineering campaigns, you do calls, you help with all of that. I am so, well, like, and we in marketing are so super paranoid because we realize that we're not as technical yeah. and like terrified, terrified. Don't with us. <laughs> I've always relied so I, I, I think strangers. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, so uh, all right. So user awareness training, you should do it. And you should never expect it to be 100%, but nothing in this industry is. You know, whenever we talk to customers, even about Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, they're like, well, would it be able to stop all attacks and detect all attacks? And we're like, no. And we're saying that because we're not stupid. Uh, we've been doing this a really long time. You want multiple overlapping layers of defense. So this is weird. Chris, have you looked at the security features in Office 365 recently? Not recently, no. Oh my word. Um, so this, uh, I would say about two, three weeks ago, um, I started doing a heavy amount of research on this and they got it. I mean, it, for Office 365, they get it and they get it really well. They have something called Microsoft Cloud App Security. And it's basically user behavioral and entity analytics baked in to their cloud security offering. Um, and I think it's uh, $3 a month add-on. Uh, so if you're looking at costing, um, it's a $3 extra. So if you're using Office 365 costing. for your company. Huh? Nothing. Costing? For costing, for pricing. Oh, okay, go ahead. Pricing and costing. Do it. Do it. Whatever. Pricing is I'm giving you a price. Costing is when you're getting, never mind. Okay, go ahead, go. <laughs> 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 and so, is that three dollars per user three dollars per user okay. as an add-on fee um and it has user behavioral and entity analytics it has alerting has powershell integration it is absolutely wow. amazing what this actually does and i brought this up the attack was actually against google apps and i'm going to talk about google apps here in just a minute but like i said microsoft gets it right so I'm sorry for the next few screenshots um, and I'm about to show you. We could show you screenshots from our instance. Uh, Kent is just turning this on now and getting it configured. And I also feel a little uncomfortable showing the security dashboard for Black Hills Information Security. That seems like that might be bad, but I'll walk through what these are. Um, so this right here are the policies uh, that you can establish into uh, Office 365 cloud app security. You can look for unusual file share activity, file download, multiple failed login attempts, that would be your password spring, um, deletion activity, suspicious IP addresses trying to authenticate or authenticating multiple failed login attempts, followed by a successful log attempt that does nothing afterwards. Um, just amazing, impossible travel. If you have a user that is logged in from New York City and is also logged in from LA at the same time or five minutes after, that is right, we wanna know about that. A country that you almost never see anyone log in for. And you can establish rules that whenever these alerts are actually triggered, what you want it to do in response. Do you want it to actually lock that particular account out? Um, do you wanna block that specific IP address? Um, this is actually better than Azure's um, Active Directory because you know Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics, you can install that for user behavioral and entity uh, analytics on a domain, but to move that into Azure with their Active Directory, they still don't have that capability, but they do have that capability. Um, with the different apps that come in through Office 365. So this would be for your Word online, your PowerPoint online, authentication, SharePoint, all of that. They actually have this uh, behavioral analytics that you can turn on and it's cheap, um, which I think is just fantastic. This is a horrible screenshot, but you can also dig in 
to if you see an attack coming in, you can get a whole bunch of information associated with that specific IP address, what that IP address was trying to access, what files that IP address accessed as well. So Chris, this was a, I remember years ago, you and I were talking, we got into an argument. Um, I was of the opinion that uh, AWS was going to beat Azure, right? I, I thought that Amazon had a much better approach. They had a good head start on Microsoft. And recently I, I read somewhere that Azure has actually passed uh, Amazon AWS in total revenue for their cloud hosting uh, that they provide. And then doing things like this, it just becomes more and more difficult for an organization to step away uh, from Microsoft completely. This is just fantastic. So I wanted to kind of get your opinion on this and kind of what you thought of it as well. So my gripes with Microsoft Azure are still consistent in that when you look at uh, the number of CPU cycles you get per amount of memory for a VM versus uh, Amazon or anybody else, they're like the worst out there. They're just, they're really expensive. Uh, with that said, they're definitely, uh, Amazon kind of went after the startup group crew, and then they've kind of expanded and built their offering from there. Uh, Microsoft, I think, intelligently said, we're going to play it the other way down. We're going to go from enterprise and kind of work our way down the stack from there. So, yeah, I mean, it's cool to see them doing neat stuff. Competition is always a good thing. Um, as far as, you know, which one will win the cloud war? I mean, you know, hopefully we're all out of this industry by then. So <laughs> I, I always hope that there's more competition. Like, you know, we got Google is in this space now. Uh, Google Cloud, and then you got DigitalOcean. I, I, I think it's best for everybody. Competition is great. It drives costs down. And then it also, if Microsoft is doing something like this, my hope is that Google will start doing something like this shortly. And I'll talk about Google here in just a couple yep. of minutes. Uh, so competition is always good. Hopefully no one wins the cloud war. It's just this parity war that goes on forever. All right, uh, let's talk about getting some docs. Once again, back to my screenshots, which I like quite a bit. Um, let's get some docs. So post exploitation pulling documents down. Now Cred Sniper has the ability after it has the two factor authentication code, the user ID and the password, it has the ability to generate an app password so it can continue to access the email and the documents associated with the target organization. And you can start siphoning the documents out of an organization. This gets into a huge problem. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I've been in this industry long enough, I'm seeing these cycles. Uh, do you remember years ago, Chris, where everyone was worried, this would have been about 2003, four timeframe, was worried about shares on their folders in Active Directory. They were worried about permissions on their files and their folders. And there were tools that came up, um, I can't remember, there was one of them that was heavily used, that would audit all the permissions on all of your shares and all of your folders. And then you could go through and you could restrict access, you could find everyone or anyone access on shares or folders, shut that off, and then it went quiet for almost a decade. And then PowerShell yeah. Empire comes out and they increment, uh, they implement ShareFinder and FileFinder and all of a sudden this is a big deal again, right? And that's fantastic research, but we're seeing this kind of repeating uh, like cycle that shows up again and again. The problem with cloud-based services is, especially when you're looking at something like Google, the default logging that you get is horrid. You gotta spend a lot more yeah. money to get up to a better logging profile. And there's very little in the way of tools that enable you uh, from the vendors like Google to do audits of all your files and all of your shares in your organization. So this is kind of sad. And then we move to other services that can integrate with authentication like Google, like Git. And in this particular example of the attack, um, we gained access to their Git repository and we were able to go through the repository and identify passwords. So the example that I created, did someone change the password for the firewall? I tried super secret password one, two, three, four. It did not work, please change it back. And in this particular assessment, we were then able to gain access to their firewalls. Um, so this is huge, right? So what sucks the most about this is Google doesn't have those built-in capabilities that you can purchase from something like Microsoft. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go out and uh, you're going to have to purchase a CASB, uh, which is amazing because their entire business model is built around the idea that the default auditing, the default security for something like Google is so bad that they can come in and they can develop an entire product line around that uh, for compliance. So you got like Forcepoint, uh, Netscope, Managed Methods, CloudLock from Cisco that kind of creates an abstraction layer for authentication, and then they watch what the users are doing, and then they can generate security alerts around that. Also, Sky High Networks. I uh, it was Googling Sky High, 
and they have a logo and i think mac <laughs> owns them but instead i found this uh <laughs> this tv poster from sky high the movie with kurt <laughs> russell and i figured that sky high's network logo sucked and i replaced it with this one because the bus that flies awesome so um so Hey, so, hey, just to, just to uh, wind you back a little bit, John, my other issue with Google is that everything you need to check for authentication is not in one place. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, when you're talking about AD, mm -hmm. I can go in and there's kind of one place for me to look to see what has access to data and what doesn't. With Google, it could be the user's login credentials. It could be an app-specific password like you were talking about. Um, I could have, you know, granted another application specific access to it. So you kind of feel like, oh, if I go in and audit my users, I understand who has access to what, but there's actually a couple of other layers you need to go after, which, you know, from a functionality standpoint, you can do some cool stuff with it. But from a security aspect, it's a complete blind spot unless you know to go looking for it. Yeah, and I was talking with uh, systems administrators a year and a half ago when I thought we were breached. Um, we weren't. For, for the record. And to get the audit logs to say, well, I want to know every single file or folder that this specific user account touched, we weren't able to get that data. Um, I wanted to know every single file and folder that an account had access to, couldn't get that data either. We had to literally go in and pay for a higher tier. And what was weird is once we paid for that higher tier, all that legacy data and those logs were yeah, there. Still we were there. able to get it. Yep. So, and it's interesting to me, the reason why this is really interesting is you look at what Microsoft is doing. Um, Microsoft is traditionally like this, right? If you have a CASB, right? Forcepoint, Netscope, Managed Methods, CloudLock, and they have a business and they're trying to do something hooking into your product, Microsoft's going to want to stand up their own product offering that can compete with that directly because why would you give that money to someone else? And their price point is fantastic. $3 is, is great. And I wonder how long this particular market space will exist until if Google and everyone else starts catching up with the idea that they need to have these controls baked in and they can do it cheaper. So we'll have to see uh, moving forward. This is one thing that just bothers me. I don't yeah, but like we, having we get to, say, to decide that. We get to decide that because they won't do that until they decide it's costing them money. And we get to decide if it's costing the money or not. So well, and to be completely honest, looking at it for the companies that we have. Uh, by the way, Sierra and I were talking about starting a new company before you joined. Not me. Awesome. <laughs> no, no, you were talking about it. You wanted to be the queen of the super company. <laughs> more but power. The company that more runs have, the other more two. Power. More power. Um, Do we have to get her a Metcalf? <laughs> yes, we should. Bob, Bob, Bob. All right, so that's my impression of Klingon, even though I'm sure someone- I don't there. know about Star Wars. Some... <laughs> Just kidding. I already made them. <laughs> someone will correct my grammar on my Klingon. But, um, but you know, I'm actually seriously uh, thinking about moving our infrastructure for email and thinking about moving that from Google to Microsoft just because of these security controls that they have in place. I'm not going to do that next week. I know that Jordan and Kent and DRock are probably listening and they're like, oh my God, no, not now. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's the way it works. Horses admins. Horses admins. Horses admins. admins. That you keep trying to like steal. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, change the firewall, change the world. Um, as part of one of our assessments, once we gained access to the firewall uh, user ID and password and Git, uh, we were able to authenticate and then create new rules that we could gain access to a number of additional resources. Um, so <laughs> the best defense for this is please don't make it easy. You don't put your passwords and keys in public repositories. And this, this happens way more than it actually should. And yeah. if you ever have the pen testing community say thank you, uh, you really have to be careful about what that thank you actually means. Because it may not mean what you think it means, right? <laughs> this um, is a perfect example. <laughs> and, this is, and this is like, I, I like to get into arguments when people are talking about security controls. And somebody will say, well, an eight character password can be just as secure as a 15 character password. And I can argue, we can show them math, we can show them how that's just so incredibly wrong on so many levels. And if I'm ever arguing with you and I just start saying, Thank you. I appreciate it. That that means the conversation's taken a dark turn because you're giving me and my company job security at that point. Um, you just need to be very careful about where you're putting things and, and just don't argue, right? So yeah, cyber deception. Once again, love cyber deception. So this is really cool. Uh, Chris, I was telling you about this. We should actually throw some fake AWS keys. Um, so what you can do, you can go to the website, canarytokens.org. 
forward slash generate and we'll probably crash the website because we have well over 100 people on the webcast today and you can generate uh they're not fake aws keys they are in fact aws keys and if anybody tries to use those aws keys it'll actually generate an alert and you do this with svn you can do uh, documents pdfs you can create web elements you can create images you can create all kinds of different artifacts that'll beacon back if they're ever utilized so with the AWS keys, if you are going to use like get repositories and have user IDs, passwords, AWS keys, put in some fake ones. That way, you know, somebody has gained access to your GitHub repository. And what's cool is whenever they try to authenticate, it generates a nice email to you. And it says the Canary token has been triggered by the source mm -hmm. IP address. And it'll give you details and get geolocation information on that IP address. Just fantastic resources. Um, I, like I said, I just can't get enough of the cyber deception world because I think it's so important moving forward. It also fits in with that idea of active defense. You need to be involved in your defensive approach, not just buying products and implementing them. Uh, so wanted to, we're kind of wrapping up here as we'd like to leave the last 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we have some questions queued up, so I'll go through this. We'll come back to questions. Okay. And uh, what we do, we, we're active countermeasures and Black Hills Information Security, but this one's predominantly by active countermeasures. We provide a product called AI Hunter. Uh, it, I'd like to say it's the premier network threat hunting tool out there. We want to make everyone a hunter. Um, advanced beacon detection, DNS tunnel, looking for misconfigured service, data visualization that's actually useful. If you want a demo, just shoot an email to questions at activecountermeasures.com. Um, and uh, we, we'd love to do a demo with you. So. Chris, anything else you want to talk about this uh, while well, Sierra's queuing up the questions? So I hate to say it, but you spelled active countermeasures wrong. Oh, uh, <laughs> not John, not a typo. Just kidding. I always spell right countermeasures now? wrong. Chris, with K, <laughs> and I had this discussion that countermeasures is a really tricky word. It is. It is a really tricky and word. And your email address is misspelled. Oh, that's it. I think no, my name's thing. John but this is questions. <laughs> okay, that's not how you spell John. Um, all right, cool. Anything else, Chris, besides that? Just that it was uh, fun getting you to teach things, teach uh, John to teach you things that AI Hunter that could do that you didn't realize, like identifying oh. when beacons actually get activated. Oh, can I, can I, do you want to walk? I, Dude, you got to talk about that. I'm sorry. That so blew much. my mind. That blew my mind this week. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Set it up. So uh, long story short. So, you know, AI Hunters has been John's baby. He's been, you know, hunting with this for quite some time now. So anytime we can kind of pull out something and show him that we can do with it that he didn't realize is always awesome. One of the things AI Hunter will do is it looks at the uh, timing of sessions as well as the session size of sessions to go in and go looking for beacons. And one of the things that kind of cool is that when a system is compromised and it's calling home saying, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And it's in that loop of, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No. Hey, do you have anything for me to do? No. That session is always going to be a specific size. Well, you can actually <clears throat> time graph if that changes with AI Hunter. So I can actually go in and tell you, A, yes, your system's compromised, but B, I can answer that other big question, did the attacker ever actually activate the malware? Because as we know, if somebody just got something evil on my system but never touched it, cleanup after that isn't too bad. But if they got in and maybe activated it, whoa, all bets are off at that point, not just for that system, but anything else that it might have touched. With AI Hunter, we can actually go in and say, yeah, unfortunately, they did activate it. It looks like it happened at, you know, 1137 UTC. Mm -hmm. um, so, that yeah, that's kind of a fun thing you can do with the tool. And too. the way the graph would look in that, and this is cool, is this is actually interval, but the data graph looks very similar. If they've never activated a backdoor or never interacted with the backdoor, you would see the data size have a very, very, very strong graph. Um, you'd have a data size and you'd have like 7,000 connections of the exact same size because there's no data. But what you would see once it was activated and data was being exfiltrated is you would see another spike um, that would be indicative that the data was actually being moved off of the system as well. Um, yep. So like Chris said, it's just awesome whenever we see things uh, where it's doing stuff that we just didn't know because I work a lot of incident response and when people say, well, the attacker had a backdoor, did they actually exfiltrate data? I, I normally can't answer that question ever. And, and now you can. can. <laughs> and now you can, dude. All right. Um, wanted to say thanks. Uh, I didn't add Chris's stuff here because I modified the existing slide deck. 
Uh, but these are the patches that I wear, right? You know, Security Weekly, Black Hills Information Security, SANS, Active Countermeasures, IANS. Um, just thank you so much. And, you know, the joking about starting up another company and doing things, it's great that we get the opportunity to talk with everybody on these webcasts and uh, go through your questions. So let's get, to, get through some questions now. Um, Martin had kind of a comment. Uh, he said, I experienced an interesting thing with Windows Defender today. It actually adapted in the middle of the day to prevent an attack that I had created in a macro. Very impressed with that. Embedded Metasploit payload got blocked on a cloud-based rule. Mm. So that's kind that's of cool. nice. Yeah, Windows Defender is coming on strong, um, especially if you enable advanced threat protection, which is advanced, which is different than advanced threat analytics. But advanced threat protection is Microsoft's uh, kind of competitor for Silence and CrowdStrike. Yeah. Um, so Glenn said, "Book me, homie, for a demo. Uh, if Do you it. would like a demo of uh, AI Hunter, you can go to ActiveCounterMeasures.com, and there's lots of information there. This webcast is recorded, and you will be able to find it on the Active Countermeasures YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed, go subscribe. Um, has Sierra got a NASCAR jacket yet? No, I, I, nobody I sponsors really see me you except with for the NASCAR Black jacket Hills wearing information on. security and Active Countermeasures. So I, I'm, I'm building my patches, but uh, you could do like a punk rock jean jacket with patches. <laughs> that would be. Um, uh, okay, so any plans for home licenses for AI Hunter? Um, yeah, absolutely. If you look at uh, the way that we built the product, every and everything, Rita is free. Uh, Rita is the core engine of what drives AI Hunter, and you can absolutely set up Rita at home. Um, I, for a home network, Chris, I don't think it would take that much. That wouldn't take that beefy of a box, but you can install it at home and you can get a lot of the data um, off of Rita. And we have the ability to export in HTML and human readable and export to a CSV. So if you want to play around with this technology and see what it does, we set up a Rita box at home. Um, and then, okay, so go back a couple slides. Doop, doop, that one more. Yeah, that you were talking about that. Joe said, what, then your opinion of LastPass is bad. My opinion of LastPass is bad. I don't know. That's a question. No, it's not. Okay. I, I mean, no. Yeah, we like passwords. Makes managers. me uncomfortable. Makes me very uncomfortable to have all my passes in one uh, passwords in one basket. But it's infinitely yes. better than having the same password or writing passwords down. Um. Yes. Okay. And then this question from Brian. He thought it might be a little bit off topic, but um. I think we have a couple minutes. So he says, I know this isn't geared for this talk, so maybe answered later, but if if you're doing a packet capture during a scan, is there anything to look for that would indicate that it's a response from a port spoof? Um, yeah, so what you would see if you're actually doing a port scan uh, against a something like port spoof, um, one of the things that's gonna be a dead giveaway is that the uh, scan is taking forever, right? Um, the other thing that you can do is if you actually fire up TCP dump and if it's actually hitting the ports multiple times again and again and again, because port spoof will show up and give a different banner for each like TCP connection, uh, full session actually. Um, so you'll see it hitting the same ports over and over and over and over again. Um, so that would be another indication. Um, but yeah, basically running a, uh, running a packet capture while it's going, the biggest indication that you would be that would tip you off is that it's taken forever. Sorry, I'm looking at the questions as they come up. Yeah. So yeah, the yeah, one I thing I will say you. is you're actually using the Linux stack, so there's nothing to try and fingerprint to identify the tool that way. You're really looking at a real Linux system. So yeah. Okay. Um, James has a question. Would you see Rita functional on a Raspberry Pi running Kali with a 64 gig card? or is that pushing it? Yeah, it would work just fine, but it would fill up quick. Because um, remember, Rita is also going to be uh, running Bro. So you're gonna be generating a lot of logs off of Bro. So yeah, giving a simple 64 gig card may not be the best approach, but if you wanted to, even the Raspberry Pi, I'd say it would be a bit underpowered. You do wanna give it a system, if you're running it on yeah. home use, you'd wanna give it a system, I would say, with at least eight gigs of memory and uh, like a quad core. Uh, do you think that that's about right, Chris? I'm less worried about the quad core, more worried about the eight, gig, eight, yeah, eight gigs of RAM. Yeah, yeah. Especially if there's going to be, yeah, because you know, when we talk about home network connections, those used to be fairly slow. I mean, I've got 250 megabit into my house these days. Yeah. So, and, you know, if Bill Stearns comes to visit, I'm going to kill a box like that. So. <laughs> right. As soon as he opens up like 95 tabs and everything he's working on, that's pretty crazy. Oh, dude, he has killed my home router more than once already. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just, we are kind of running out of time, so I want to announce the winners of the book. Um, if you're here and I call your name, go ahead and let me know in the questions. The first one is Mike Fernandez. Are you around, Mike? Mike. 
Fernandez. <laughs> Glenn immediately is like, not here. He's here. He okay, is here. so Mike, uh, email me, <laughs> sear at bhs.co, and I will send you a book. And then the next one is Garrett Nickel. Are you here, Garrett? And if it wasn't you, you can go to blackhillsinfosec.com slash stickers and we will send you stickers. Okay, Garrett, good. Okay, so we got our two winners. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, so if you didn't win anything, sorry, but we also have a different program that we started, blackhillsinfosec.com slash FWA. So go check that out. You might want to do that. That's pretty cool. Um, and we will post this on the ACM YouTube. So go subscribe. All right, cool. Thank you, John, for being here. And thank you, Chris. It was awesome to have you. And I'm glad it finally worked out to connect and get everything. Um, and if, we just really appreciate everyone being on. So thank you. And thanks for all the nice things that you tell us. Literally, I can't keep up with so many compliments, but it's awesome to hear that you guys are appreciating what we're doing. So have a great afternoon. We'll talk to you later.